good you are to us. We thank you for this beautiful morning, this great weekend. And we just uh, want to come and lift up your name and just praise you for how awesome you are. We thank you for this time as family to come together and worship you and to celebrate your goodness for us. Lord, help us as to align our hearts with you right now and to focus our minds on what you'd have to tell us and what you'd have to show us this morning. In your son's name we pray, amen. Shame is a prison, cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber, and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lift me up from the ground. Love is a power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down trumpet sound I'm gonna rise up out of the ground there ain't no Smooth and velvet tongue Fear is a tyrant He's always telling me to run Oh, love is resurrection And love is a trumpet sound Love is my weapon I'm gonna take my giants down There ain't no grave my body down There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down When I hear that trumpet sound Rise up out of the ground There ain't no grave Gonna hold my body down Oh, there was a battle A war between death and life there on the tree, the Lamb of God was crucified. He went on down to hell. He took back every key. He rose up as a lion, and he set all the captives free. There ain't no sound rose up out of the ground there ain't no grave hold his body down there ain't Hold him. 
walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to If you walked out of the grave I'm walking to There ain't no That was a great song of triumph, wasn't it? Great reason to be here today is to be reminded of the power in Jesus. So I'm glad to be here. My name is Jill Woods. I'm the worship assistant this morning. Um, welcome to Orange City United Methodist Church. Those of you who are watching online, hello everyone. We're glad you're joining us today. Take a moment to find the registration book which is at the end of your aisle, and please sign your name and let us know if you are new to our church or visiting with us today. The church council met on Tuesday the 19th. I was so glad to see so many of you there as we're working to fulfill our mission to reach, serve, and love like Jesus. We've been working on a couple of initiatives in addition to welcoming and stewardship. We are also focusing on our internal, external communication and enhancing family worship. The big red bus is coming. I bet you guys know what that is, don't you? I kind of avoided that, but I've already signed up because it's going to be here at our church on Thursday, and I hope you will too. So um, there's quite a bit of incentives, right? A $20 e-coupon, a T-shirt, et cetera, a free um, health screening. So it's going to be worth your while. There's an insert in the bulletin today, this one right here, okay? And so I hope that you all will take advantage of that opportunity to really give life to someone. How amazing is it that we can do that? So that's from uh, September 28th from 7.30 to 12.30. And if you are new to our church, we would love to connect with you. We are having a pizza with the pastor. Come and grab a slice on Sunday, October 8th at 12.15 in the Fellowship Hall. And if you're interested in, in doing that and coming to have pizza with us, now if you're already a member, you can't come to that. <laughs> but if you're new and you want to consider joining, we would love to have you on that day. And we are excited to have Family Night in coming up on October 13th. It's going to be a great fellowship night for all of us to welcome some of the parents and children that have been coming on the monthly Friday night out for parents. And we're going to have lots of fun stuff because you know Heidi always plans lots of fun stuff for everyone. There's a soft play area, a bounce house, um, and it's going to be potluck so you guys get to bring your favorite dish. That's from 5 to 8. And you can RSVP to the church office or online. So now we're going to take a breath and, um, and go to prayer. And the first thing that we're going to do is have an opportunity to lift up, either aloud or in your heart, those concerns that you have for yourself, your loved ones, our community, our world. So let us go in prayer. Father, hear now the concerns that we have that are on our heart this morning. Father, we bring concerns from our own homes, our own communities, our church, and around the world. We lift those people that have been devastated by floods and earthquakes. We pray, Lord, for recovery for all of those that are responders, for all of those that are showing your love to these people and bringing forth life and bringing forth hope. That's what we want, Lord. We want hope, and we have that in you. Lord, we pray for um, our church. We thank you, Father, that you have created this body together, that we can be here for one another, we can support one another, encourage one another. 
We thank you for our pastor, Father, and for his desire to bring your word to us and minister to us in so many ways. We thank you for the new members joining our church today and pray, Lord, that we will be faithful in supporting them as they grow in their discipleship. And Father, now let us in unison say our prayer for our church this morning. Heavenly Father, our God who has all knowledge, all power, who is King and Lord of life, we come before you with thanksgiving and praises. We come to you, Abba, to ask for healing of our church. We ask for your goodwill. We ask for knowledge as to maintain our church in financial health. We ask for growth in our church to build your kingdom. We thank you for all your provision, your grace and mercy. We love you, Lord, and seek the Holy Spirit to lead the way. We pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And now I invite Stephanie up, who's going to give the children's moment. It's so wonderful to see these little ones grow up in our church. Good morning. It's a little chilly outside. You're both wearing long sleeves. Just a little bit. Come on up. I want to tell you a story about when I was a little girl. What do I have here? A little basket. And inside I have some food and I even have some fake money. I'm going to give you guys some money, okay? You have a kitchen full of stuff like this too, Ava? That's awesome. Mm, food and shopping cart, but not money. I understand that. Mm, maybe. So when I was a little girl, I grew up in a family of four. I had an older brother and two younger sisters. JL, you have an older brother and a younger sister, right? But my younger sister is me. Yes, and Ava, you have a little sister too, right? And so my mom, she's, she's growing up. Uh, my mom had to buy a lot of food for all of us because we all ate a lot of food. And so she would get her money and she would go to the grocery store and she would buy things. So I'm gonna pick out some things and I want you to tell me what you think you'd like to buy with your money. So here's my basket of stuff. So we have, oh, you have tomato soup. You wanna buy that? Oh yeah, this is bread. You want that, Ava? And we have some, we have a banana. Who wants a banana? Mmm, and a strawberry? I don't want it. I got mm hmm Oh, I understand that. Mm hmm mm hmm So here's a spicy pepper, maybe. Ava said she likes spicy. Um, what about broccoli? Anyone want broccoli? I love broccoli, personally, so I'll take that. So we have all these yummy foods, and so my mom would go through the grocery store, Oh, there's water, and she would buy all these foods. And then she would put them in her grocery cart, or in her shopping cart. Can you put your, your groceries in the shopping cart? Very nice. Mm, Ava. <laughs> Almost got it. Can you put the water in the cart, too? And then she would take, oh, thank you. She would take her little grocery sh shopping cart, and where, did, where do you go with this? You go to the front of the store. And then what do you do with it then? You, you put the groceries on the, on the belt that moves, the little belt that moves if you're doing a regular checkout or self-checkout, you put yourself. And then you, you do all that stuff, you put it all out there and they go beep across the counter. And then when they're finished, they say, okay, that'll cost $5, Ava. And so then what do you do? Yeah. Or they say, JL, that'll cost $5. So what do you do? Perfect, so you give me your $5. And there, there were definitely times where I would say to my mom, hey, can I get Jell-O? Or can I, have, can I have cookies? Or can I have muffin bites? Or can I have pudding? 
and my mom would have to tell me, hold on, hold on, let me finish my story. She would tell me, sorry, I think it's better if we buy grapes or if we buy bananas or if we buy strawberries or if we buy broccoli um, or if we buy other things. And so she really, my mom really had to think about how she was going to spend her money to feed our family. She had to be very wise. She had to be very um, shrewd. Have you guys heard that word before? Shrewd? Can you say it? Shrewd. That's a, that's a hard word, isn't it? But really it's about being wise or clever or smart about how you spend your money. And so today Pastor Ryan's going to talk a little bit about being wise or clever or shrewd with money and using money to make sure you're using it in the best way. And we've talked about grocery shopping, but thinking about how to use your money can be applied in lots of different ways, including um, sharing your money with the church or to help other people. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you so much for everything you give to us, including money. Help us to use our money wisely, cleverly, shrewdly, so that we can impact people in the community. In your son's name we pray, amen. Thank you, guys. Head start, we'll, we'll stand up and pass the peace. Greet your, more, greet your neighbor. Huh? Start heading on back. The battle belongs to you, and every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Oh, 
Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see the beauty. Thank you, Lord. When all I see is a cross, God, you see. sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in the shadow you win every battle nothing can stand against the power of our god almighty fortress you go before us nothing can stand against the power of our god you shine in Nothing can stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you and every fear I lay at your feet. I'll sing through the night, oh God, that belongs to you. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. This next song's called. I should have had her sing it. If I'd known her story, I would have let her sing it. So when I was 16, I had started, um, I started leading worship when I was 13. And I started doing this song probably around 15, 16. But when I turned 16, on my 16th um, birthday. Today's her birthday. Yeah. So, wow. so, for, for, <laughs> so 14 years ago today. I, um, all I wanted for my 16th birthday was for my family and my friends to come to church. And so they all came. I had like two rows of, of, of pews of people that, that came. And I, and I led this song. And it's just one of my all-time favorites, especially the, the second verse where it says, I don't have time to maintain these regrets when I think about the way that he loves us. And it's just so impactful because we don't, we don't, we don't have the time to just sit there and think about the what ifs and the, and all the regrets that we have and the, and the sins that we've, we've done in our past because he's already paid the price. He's already forgiven us for all of it that we've done, what we're going to do in the future. And so just really listen to these words and just worship him. And He's here, and, he, and he's here for you. He's 
jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I'm unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory Then I realize just
have the ushers to help us as we collect the offering today. We have a, a fund that, that helps uh, worn out and struggling persons. Uh, and so we, I just wanted to say thank you for the many lives that you get to help um, who are just down and in a week and don't know where to go and they can turn to us and we can give them a little help. And so uh, as we look to spread the kingdom of God and the message of the kingdom of God, I just wanted to say thank you for all the ways that you equip us to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Let us pray. God, I thank you uh, for your love. Thank you for your love that comes so deep in us that it just is bursting out. We want to give back. We want to love the way that you do. And so, God, I pray that you would unite all of us here today, all of us together under the banner of your love. Help us to radiate that love so that all who need it receive it. And may we look and find the people who need it in just that very hour. And so, God, we pray for those who are looking for your love. May they, through this church, find it. Amen. rich I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time and sin separated the breach was far too wide but for the far side of the chasm you held me in your side so you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe, broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time.
to his name. Glory to his name. Thank you and happy birthday. We are doing a uh, two-part series on the, the parable of the shrewd manager. Uh, we're going to be looking at John Wesley. And um, John Wesley was pretty shrewd. He, just so you know, he lived off of $10 um, his whole life. And he said that if you could look at my bank account when I die and I have more than $10, you can call me a glutton. So, but he was a man, and we'll be looking at the impact that he made um, on down to us. So today's and next week's scripture is from John. It's John 16, 1 through 9. Then John, Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give me account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm not strong enough to dig. And I am ashamed to beg. I've decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may come and welcome me into their homes. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill. Sit down quickly and make it fifty. Then he said to another, And how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the children of the light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes." The word of God for the people of God. So for the next two weeks, we will be looking at the founder of our church, the Methodist church, John Wesley. I have a dog. His name is Wesley, uh, after John and Charles. We named him because of our heroes, John and Charles, but we also named him because the, pl- the first place we were appointed to, the, uh, the conference told us, you know, we want you to go and help bring Methodism to the church. It was merging with the Baptist church, or it had had merged with the Baptist church, and so we want you to go and teach them Methodism. And so we thought, what better way to name our dog Wesley? So when they asked, why is your dog named Wesley? Well, let me tell you the story. (laughs) So Wesley, not my dog, John Wesley, he is a great example of someone who brought the kingdom to England, Ireland, and Wales in his time. He is someone who looked at what Jesus did and thought to himself, how how can I do what Jesus did in my own time? And only only I, John Wesley, can in a way that only I, John Wesley, can. And so today, as you listen to his incredible story and next week, the question I want you to ask yourself is next two weeks, how can you bring the kingdom of God to the world around you in only a way you can? As you look at the story of John, Discover things about yourself that maybe you haven't discovered that could be used for the kingdom of God. Gifts, talents, skills, even the way you think. How are you living like Jesus? That is our constant question as we come to church and as we try to become Christians. How can I be like Jesus and continue to do what he did and help people, especially the poor, the outcast, and the overlooked? So today, I hope I don't bore you with all of this history, but I hope that you are inspired by John Wesley's story. 
Now, if you go and look back at the, the founders of each religion, each denomination, they did some inspiring things. They inspired their congregations and the people around them to use what they had, meager bank accounts or vast wealth, their talents, wide ranging of talents, to bring help to the, those in need. The people of churches started poor houses. They started schools. They are the ones who started hospitals. Even banking systems were created by people in the early church days with these early church fathers. The Catholic Church is an example where at the beginning there were monasteries and they devoted time and effort in creating system of education and medical care for they had monks who studied what was called apothecary and then more and more people started coming to them and then the cities decided, you know, you should do this officially and hospitals were born. And several along the way, several church leaders just kept this Thing going of creating hospitals and creating things that help those in need. And John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, is one of those who did this, used the people in his congregation to go and help people where they needed it the most. One author wrote about Methodists, the Methodists made such an impact on their nation that in 1913, historian Ellie Halevi theorized that the Wesleyan revival created England's middle class and saved England from the kind of bloody revolution that crippled France. So if you read John Wesley's sermons today, there are books with, printed with the sermons that he preached to the people in his day. You can see how this happened in the way that he inspired people. Not only did he t teach people the love of God, but he educated people to leave the world a better place than when you found it. Better yourself, but better yourself in a way that not only benefits you, but better your community, the people around you. This is one of the sermons that John Wesley preached. Money, he said, is an excellent gift of God. In the hands of his children, it is food for the hungry, drink for the thirsty, raiment for the, for the naked. It is therefore the highest concern that all who fear God know how to employ this talent, that they are instructed how it may answer and succeed in meeting this glorious end. Therefore, gain all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Now, of course, I shortened it a little bit, so I didn't want us to be here two sermons this morning. But the Bible that he said provides you with all the morality that will change your life forever. You will be able to abandon sinful habits that are destroying your life, Wesley said, and you will be able to begin a new life of holiness that will make you successful and better. He preached this message in 1760. But I want to go back, though, to the 1730s when it all began for Wesley and how this movement began that we are a part of today. In 1730, newly ordained Pastor John Wesley, he started meeting with some of his friends. He did this throughout the week. He was in Oxford at the time, and they would meet for a weekly Bible study and doing ministry together. They did the same thing every week. On Tuesdays, they would go to John Brothers Charles's house. On Thursday, they would go to the Kirkhams. Saturday, they would go to John's house, where they would go and visit the poor and those in prison. And then on Sunday, they would go over to Morgan's house. Every single week, they do the same thing. No matter what week it was, they were always could be found there. At first, they didn't really get much attention because there are a lot of people in Oxford doing these kinds of things and going to these kinds of Bible studies. But how this group gained attention is because it started to grow and it started to multiply. And when it started doing this, these groups were doing the exact same thing. In these early days, they gained a reputation for their predictableness. The Methodist people called them and made fun of them. And, but John Wesley thought it was a pretty good name of who they were and who they wanted to become. And so Wesley started referring to themselves as Methodists. As he, John Wesley became fully ordained, John started to travel all over England and Ireland and Wales. And wherever he would go, he would set up groups 
like his own. Where they'd study scripture together, they'd visit the poor together, they'd visit the sick, they'd visit those in prison, and look to help them. And the Methodists began to grow. At first, there were a movement, a reformed movement, in the group of the Church of England. But then, they grew so much, and they had so much discussion, that they decided that they needed to be their own church, Methodists. And then Methodism began, and then soon after this, it really took off. See, his ministry, John, John Wesley, was first going to eat all these church communities and forming groups within these churches, the Church of England. But then there was one day where John was invited to preach outside. This, this was a revolutionary idea back then. Preach outside in a field or in the middle of a market. While it wasn't illegal, the Church of England certainly frowned upon it, and in some ways, in some people, they thought it was heretical, which is where we get the phrase from John Wesley, the world is my parish, when responding to the Church of England, when they asked him, why are you preaching outside? When John started preaching in these fields, it reached thousands. In the first month, he reached 47,000 people, averaging 3,000 persons per sermon. I couldn't imagine preaching to 3,000 people. But it wasn't just how he preached, it was where he preached that was important that I want us to look at and think about as we do ministry in our church. You see, John preached all over. He went to England, he went to Ireland, and he went to, and to Wales. Whenever he'd get to a certain town that he was invited to, the first thing that he would do is go walking. And he would look for the place where the poorest of the poor lived. And then he'd go out and he would preach there. There was one time in 1742 where he was visiting Yorkshire in Wales and he went to this place known as Sandgate. It was known for how poor it was. And he wandered in the middle of the city and there was a guy that was with him. And the two of them, they started to sing. They started to sing the doxology as loud as they could. At first, only a few people kind of stopped by, but then by the end of that day, John was preaching to 500 people, which come, another famous quote that John Wesley would say about himself was, you know, I, I set myself on fire so that people come and watch me burn. What would it look like for you to set yourself on fire? Kind of a bold thing that he did. So after he would preach, John started meeting with these people, and he discovered what they needed. He would go and then make it happen. He would go back to his church, and he would talk to people about the people that he met there. John would talk about how he saw poor children wandering the streets all, all throughout the day and night because they were not, weren't allowed to go into school. And so he would raise money, and then he would go back to that town, and he would build a school raise money, and he would build a school. So as this group started to grow, uh, we saw that society also started to grow. As people started learning and people started being able to do what they needed to do to get ahead in life. And so you can see how John Wesley's preaching created this middle class by what he did. When Wesley preached, he talked about easy things for every person that could do. He talked about rules. He, he had this thing called the general rules that everyone could follow. And it was really easy to remember. Do no harm, do good, and always stay in love with God. Do this as often and do it anything you can to make sure these things happen in your life. And he also taught the poor how to change their life with the using of money. And he would use Simple rules, again, earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And he preached things like this, and this is what he called true Christianity. He, would, he wrote a 32-page pamphlet that was called A Plain Account of the People Called Methodists. It captured all of his rules for everyone to read, and it became the manifesto for Methodist churches. And in some ways, it defines us today because his pamphlet was the first version of what we have as the Book of Discipline. True Christianity, though, he wrote, it makes the world a better place. And so wherever he went, he created these societies that did certain things, and they all did the same thing together. 
Go take a look at, the, at this pamphlet. We'll see, you'll see the general rules, and he explains those. And then there's rules about how to create a school. It's interesting to see some of the rules that he talks about for these schools. But he wrote, you must fight evil and establish the kingdom of God through the spreading of true Christianity. You must reach out to the vulnerable and the community. Create schools, create poor houses, medical clinics, and then create what he called a lending society, which I'll go into in a second. But all of these things were revolutionary for their time. Nothing really close to like this. Well, there are some medical things like this, but in the way that he did it, it was revolutionary, especially for the people who were the poorest. So uh, can you imagine being a part of this movement? Wesley's preaching to you at your church and telling you about these people that maybe you haven't even noticed before, but you should notice them and you should help them. Now, if I were to go back in time and join one of Wesley's churches today, um, I he would first thing that we would do as I would say that I was going to follow the general rules, and then immediately he would tell me I would need to be a part of a weekly Bible study. He would give me a ticket. This is your ticket. Don't lose it. You must present it as you go into Bible study. And then also, you right now, I want you to find a place where you can give back. There are three areas that are, that are a part of our Methodist societies. We have a poor house, we have a medical clinic, and we have a lending society. Go and plug yourself into one of these things. And then, as you became a part of the church, you were held accountable for doing all of these things, or you might risk losing your ticket. There were several times when Wesley would visit a society, and he actually took away some membership tickets from some people for a little while who weren't following the guidelines. Um, so if I was going back in time again and I was going to Wesley's Bible study for the first time, I would go and sit down and the Bible study leader would go around the room and he would say, okay, and now I want each of you to tell me what sins you have committed this week. And then I want you also to tell me how are you seeking repentance and becoming free of the bonds of sin? And you had to come up with an answer. I wonder if we should do that today. If we should go around the room and he's <laughs> just kidding. Um, but listen to the, some of the things that people were, had their membership taken away for. Two of them were taken away, this is what he wrote down, two were taken away for cursing and swearing, two for habitual Sabbath breaking, 17 for drunkenness, two for retailing spiritist liquor, one for idleness or laziness, and 29 for lightness and carelessness. How many of us would have our membership taken away today? <laughs> As the Methodist Church matured, it, it formed into what it is today, and we stopped taking away people's tickets. You know, it would be fun to go back to it every once in a while. But we put more emphasis on the weight of repentance coming to the communion table in, in our history. Um, and we still do that today, making sure that communion is done at least once a month. But Wesley, as he looked at society as a whole, he had a concern for these most vulnerable people, the elderly, the children, the poor, and he saw how he, working alongside the church, could change the world. As I said, poverty was rampant in England. There was a big difference between those who were rich and those who were poor. You would go into a town and you see people with their nice carriages and hats and clothes. And then you would see on the other side people with living in shacks, some of them living on the streets. Some of them slept in the gutters. And if you look at paintings and pictures of that time, it usually depicted this. People riding in carriages alongside poor sleeping in the gutters with alcohol bottles. Until Wesley changed towns that he went to forever. When he came, he, this is what he did that created so much change. Again, there was a poor house, there was a medical clinic, and a lending house. The first thing he would set up when he would go and he would preach and people would be interested in Jesus and in the love of God is he would set up poor houses for these people. And these poor houses, they would feed people, they would clothe people, and then they would teach people. And so the Wesley would again go back, he'd raise money, and then he'd bring food and money that he collected 
for these poor houses. Then he instructed the people who were working there, I want you to give it to anyone, and I mean anyone who needs it. Does this sound familiar? Probably similar to what we do in our group today. He would raise money for also to buy clothes. And if clothes were hard to buy, if they were expensive there, he would buy yarn. And then he would go and teach the poor how to make, distribute, and sell clothes. And then he would also create a medical clinic. Wesley, which was interesting, he studied medicine. He, he even wrote a book that I, that I gave to my dad about how to bring healing to people for certain illnesses. Um, it talks about uh, how to cure things like the common cold, reoccurring cough. As I read the book, taking a cold bath was a cure for many things. For chapped lips, he says, apply a little sal manila, I mean sal prunilla. <laughs> I had to look at it twice. If you uh, were having a, a cold, um, if you had a cold yourself, he said, go and drink a pint of cold water lying down, and that'll help. And, and then he said, if you have diabetes, drink wine boiled with ginger for as long as you can bear it. He said to cure diabetes. Uh, another book you should check out. Lastly, the, the thing that Wesley would create in every society that he created was a lending house. This was, I think, more revolutionary than some of the others. It was sort of like a credit union. Church members would give Wesley money, and then he would go and take all of this money and create this lending house. He would charge a person called a steward with meeting with people and giving out short-term business loans to the poor so that they could start up their businesses and it would continue to grow and they would continue to support them. This is how Guinness, the beer company, got started. One thing that Wesley detested was spirit alcohol. It was cheap and it was really easy to get drunk from drinking it. And so he would often preach about the, the evils of spirit alcohols. So one day, the founder of Guinness was listening to John Wesley preach, and he thought, you know, I could create a beer that could be leisurely drunk and not get people drunk for just a few sips. And so he went and created Guinness. If you visit the distillery today, his Wesley's story is sometimes told a part of the tour. But what Wesley did was revolutionary. And we can say right off of Jesus' playbook, he taught people how to resist evil that is destroying your life, and how to go and live with God, who is giving you in the gift of money. Wesley oftentimes referred to money as a good gift from God to those who know how to use it. His sermons, they didn't just help people see the love of God, but Wesley's sermons created people who immediately became the love of God for their communities. And they became excellent in this way of loving and helping people who help people. They became successful. They became resources, the people who were in the Methodist societies. And some of them even come, became legends. Everyone knows the name Guinness. Wesley was really good at teaching. Now, I'm sure all of his ideas probably wasn't his own. But the way that he presented them, it really inspired people to change with these three general rules, three rules for money, just like Jesus. We know that Jesus didn't write the Torah, but he taught people how to live by the Torah. What does it mean to live by God's laws? So today, as we look out on our world, there may be some similarities between now and then as, as the expanse between the rich and the poor are becoming larger. And so we can say to ourselves, what can we do for our community? And I believe that we're already doing that through the things that we do, through our community connection, and through the, the, the funds that we set up to help people. But I want us to consciously be thinking all the time, how can we continue to bring the kingdom of God to the world around us? How can we make it so that people in the world today have everything they need to succeed? How can we be a part of the kingdom of God that is spreading to every corner of the earth? How can you spread the kingdom of God with what God has given you? John was a good preacher. He was a good teacher. And so he, he took people and connected them together. What are you good at? And what has God given you 
to bring the kingdom of God. That is what I want us to think about. Uh, um, I chose John Wesley for a reason, because as we go into this stewardship, I'll be asking you, where has God placed you right now that you can be your resources for the people in our community? Let's pray. God, I thank you uh, for the legacy of John Wesley, and more so, I thank you for the legacy of Jesus that is still inspiring people today. I pray that you inspire us to bring the good news to all people, especially those who need it the most. God, help us not to overlook them, but help us to see exactly what they need and find the resources to help people in our community. God, we pray that you would continue to help us as we seek to change the world. Amen. Y'all want to stand up and sing with us? And then don't leave, because we got to new members, right? You didn't want to do that first? Amen. So I want to have a, we have the amazing privilege to welcome some people who have seen what's going on with our church and wanted to take be a part of us. So I invite those now up in front of us to introduce themselves uh, as they look to join the church today. And briefly, I would just like you to tell us your name 
and who you who, who you are. Yeah, just tell us your name as we go through. Do I need to hold it? I can hold it okay, for you. Okay, thank you. My name is Judy Taylor. Judy. Doug Graff. Doug Graff. Cindy Garrison. Cindy Garrison. Michael Wright. We are excited to welcome them, and so we're going to ask them the questions that we have answered in our church um, as they become a part of Orange City United Methodist Church. Well, oh, go to go back to the beginning. Do you re renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? If so, I will. Will you accept the freedom and power that God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression? If so, I will. Do you confess Jesus Christ as Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord? Will you remain faithful members of Christ's holy church and serve as Christ's representatives in the world? Will you be loyal to Christ, the United Methodist Church, and do all your power to strengthen its ministries? So I will. Will you participate in their ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Do you receive and profess the Christian faith as contained in the scripture of both Old and New Testaments? And now... I ask you, the body, as we do, uh, form, to affirm your faith together as they are affirming theirs. Do you, as Christ's body, the church, reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ today? Will you nurture one another in Christian faith and life and include these persons now before you in your care? To help, we will proclaim the good news and live according to the example of Christ. We will surround these persons with a community of love and forgiveness, that they may grow in their service to others, and we will pray for them, that they may be true disciples who walk in the way that leads to life. All right, and so now we welcome them into our church, so please welcome them, and they will be walking back with me at the end of service so you can greet them today, but let us congratulate them. Amen. This has been a wonderful past couple of weeks as people have been inspired and it's really been wonderful to hear their stories and I'm looking forward to hearing more. So now I invite you to stand with me and receive the benediction. May Christ bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. May God use you to bring love into corners that desperately need it. May you see those places with joy and passion. Amen. Have a good week.